Hello everyone, today we want to have a closer look at how we can include edge features and graph neural networks. I assume in the following that you are familiar with GNNs or have watched the corresponding series I recently uploaded. At the end I'll also quickly show how edge features can be used in PyTorch Geometric. Let's start with the question why edge features are even important. Isn't the information in the node sufficient to create meaningful embeddings? A typical graph can be a social network like the one shown here. Node features in our graph are for instance the age of the people, their weight or whether they smoke. Additionally, we know for each of our nodes if they like the movie Hobbit. These are the labels in this example. Now let's assume we have a new person joining our graph and of course we are immediately interested if the person is also a Hobbit fan. Well, to answer this question we can build a graph neural network that combines the node features and the connections of the nodes in order to classify this new member of the network. Doing so, all we use if two people are connected or not. But there is so much more information we can get out of this relationship. If we had edge features that describe the type of connection, such as since when the people are friends or if they live together, we would have a valuable additional source of information. And this is the case for many applications of graph neural networks. By adding further properties to the edges, so not just the binary information, we can empower the GNN to get much better. In the following I want to show a couple of ways how edge features are typically utilized in the literature to help you to get started. Using edge features in graph neural networks is still a hot research topic and there are different ways how we can do this. As you might know, edge features are just like node features, nothing else but a vector of values. Let's start with the most basic form of this vector, a single binary value. This simply means either we have a connection or not. If we have a look at our simple graph, we can easily represent the connections in a matrix. Numerically this can be converted to either 1 or 0. And voila, that's the adjacency matrix of our graph. It's symmetrical along the diagonal as we have bidirectional edges in our social network. To make sure that we are on the same page, let's quickly have a look at how this basic edge information is utilized in a regular GNN. So I try to generalize the overall process in graph neural networks to make sure we have the same thing in mind. Let me tell you that it's not straightforward to generalize all of the different GNN variants into one summary. And please forgive me if there's an approach that doesn't fit perfectly into that pattern. Say we want to generate a node embedding for Alice. What we always do is collect the neighbor nodes, in our case those two gentlemen, with the node feature vectors in blue. Next we prepare the messages for the message passing step. Most GNNs therefore apply some sort of differential transformation to these node features, in order to get a high level representation. This can be simply a multilayer perceptron, but also things like ReLU. These transformed representations are then aggregated in some way. The important thing here is that this aggregation is permutation invariant. That means the order of our nodes is not relevant. These aggregations are often also normalized according to the degree of the node, which means how many neighbors a node has. What we retrieve is a summarized representation of Alice's neighborhood in the graph. Finally, we combine the original node features with the aggregated neighbor embedding. And this can be again any differential function such as another MLP, a gated recurrent unit or just a sum. We obtain a new embedding for Alice that contains information about her and her neighbors. This embedding can be used to perform a prediction for our Hobbit classification by using another fully connected layer. Then we can calculate the loss, so how far are we away from the correct prediction and then we adjust all the learnable matrices in our layers such as transform and update. That's especially the reason why they need to be differentiable. We want to be able to calculate gradients. So that's how we perform representation learning in a nutshell. We can summarize this procedure in the following formula. Again, there exist many different variants, so this might deviate from approach to approach. For instance, we can add self loops and simplify the formula like this, as Alice herself is now part of her neighborhood. Okay, so now back to the original question. Where is the edge information used in this process? The basic binary edge information is used directly when we select the neighbor nodes. For this selection we of course don't loop over all nodes, instead in a GNN layer matrix multiplications are performed. When we multiply the adjacency matrix with the feature matrix, this neighborhood aggregation is implicitly performed. 
All non-adjacent nodes are basically zeroed out and we only share information between the nodes that are directly connected. So in our formula, this part stands for the multiplication with the adjacency matrix. So far, so good. Now, the first trivial option to utilize edge features is by using edge weights. That simply means instead of ones and zeros, we have weights in the adjacency matrix. For instance, we could encode how happy the people are with the other person. Okay, this is a stupid example, but for instance, Alice likes it a lot to spend time with her boyfriend, but not vice versa. That's why we put a 0.9 and a 0.4 here. Let's have a look at this propagation formula in the matrix form from the GCN paper. The first part is the normalized adjacency matrix. X, the current node feature matrix. And the last part is the multiplication with the learnable weight matrix. X prime is the new embedding. It's straightforward to replace the adjacency matrix now with the weighted adjacency matrix and as a result people Alice is close to are more emphasized in the propagation. This usage of edge weights can be easily added in most of the graph neural network implementations. Now imagine we not only have a weight for the connection but also use different types of connections. In our social network we would for instance differentiate between different relationship types such as friends, couple or colleagues. If we have such a setup our edge features are simply one dimensional vectors with integer values. This for instance typically occurs when working with molecule data as you have single, double or triple bonds. There exist several papers on how we can include such discrete edge types in a GNN. The first approach we want to have a look at is called Relational Graph Convolutional Network from the paper referenced below. Let's quickly investigate this propagation formula. We calculate Alice's new embedding by summing over the neighbor nodes so this is our aggregation and applying a MLP transformation to each of these node feature vectors. Finally, there's a nonlinear function such as ReLU applied to generate a new embedding. The green section is just a normalization and the last part of this formula is another transformation applied on Alice's original node features, which doesn't really fit into my structure here. The new part here is now that we have the sum over R. And this sum simply represents the different relations we have, so edge types. You see that the weight matrix is indexed with this R as well. That simply means depending on the type of edge we apply different transformations to the nodes. This is sometimes also called edge conditioned GNN. If we visualize this, we quickly see depending on the type of Alice's neighbor, friend, couple or colleague, we pass the node vector through the corresponding weight matrix. Doing so we can include the edge information as we have different transformations applied based on the type of connection. As a consequence we will of course also have different adjacency matrices. So one that holds the information for friends, one for couple connections and finally another one for colleagues. Also note how the embedding of Alice's partner is yellow and the embedding of her friend is blue as they went through different transformations. So as you see this first approach is pretty intuitive. Let's have a look at the next paper which is called Graph Neural Networks with Feature-wise Linear Modulation. The propagation formula looks slightly different but regarding edges we have exactly the same concept here. We again sum over all neighbors but differentiate between the type of connection L. And this L is also the index of our transformation matrix W. So the transformation we apply on each different neighbor node vector depends on the relationship with Alice. There are a couple of other things happening in this formula, but we can ignore them as we just want to look at edge-related things here. For including different edge types, other similar papers exist, but I think you get the point how this can be handled. I found this overview in the GNN film paper, which provides a nice summary. It shows how different node features A, B, C, D are multiplied with separate weight matrices. The little arrow that appears in the index of some weight matrices stands for self loops. Now let's have a look at the most interesting and also most general case. What if we have multidimensional vectors for each of our edges? This is basically what we had in the introductory example when we added since when are people friends or if they live together. One way to handle these edge features is to directly integrate them into the transformation of the neighborhood states. Let's have a look at the general propagation formula presented in the message passing neural network paper. Here we see that we can include the edge features E between node W and node V 
in the transformation step when we calculate the embedding. You see that we have two indices here. So that's the edge information from node W to node V. Another way to think of these edge features is like an adjacency matrix that has vectors instead of ones and zeros. So the zero here stands for an edge feature vector filled with zeros. The shape of our adjacency matrix is then number of nodes time number of nodes time the dimension of the edge features. This is just a side note and happens mostly internally when multiplying the different matrices. Again, let's have a look at a couple of papers to understand how we can include these multidimensional edge features. In the paper Neural Message Passing for Quantum Chemistry, the authors simply input both the node features as well as the edge features into the message function. This transformation is typically a multi-layer perceptron, so we can visualize it like this. In the case of Alice, we always take Alice's embedding, her direct neighbor, and in between the edge features for that connection. This way we include the edge features into our transformed representation. The other things in this propagation formula are already familiar to us. We perform some sort of aggregation and combine the representation through an update function with Alice's original node features. Pretty intuitive, right? A similar idea can be found in the paper Principal Neighborhood Aggregation for Graph Nets. Here we also simply include the edge features into the transformation step as it's shown here. The paper about crystal graph convolutional nets uses the same approach and we can easily see how the edge features, denoted with U here, are concatenated with the node features V in order to obtain a vector for each node edge node triple. This combined vector is then again transformed by multiplying it with a learnable weight matrix. Again there exist other papers that share similar approaches for the multidimensional edge features and I'll link a couple of them here for completeness. Most of them are also implemented for PyTorch Geometric. So now we've already seen a lot of ways how we can include edge features in graph neural networks. Finally, another way to use them is to create edge embeddings. That's like creating node embeddings but using the edge features instead. This is the last approach we will quickly investigate in this video. One recent paper, displayed on the right, uses a so-called hierarchical dual-level attention mechanism. That simply means they have alternating layers, one that updates node embeddings and then one that creates edge embeddings and so on. The propagation formulas look like this. We can see that the edge features are used in both layers to generate new embeddings. The left layer generates node embeddings and the right layer edge embeddings. Additionally, they use the attention mechanism and thus learn how important specific nodes or edges are for the new embedding. The importance coefficients are alpha and beta here. So to summarize it, this approach iteratively updates node and edge embeddings in order to merge both information together. Similarly as the previous paper, this approach now also incorporates the edge features when calculating the attention coefficients. Here only one layer is required as both the node and edge embeddings are updated simultaneously. The edge embeddings are simply set to the calculated attention coefficients alpha. So instead of using the adjacency matrix and calculating the node embeddings, as on the left here, we now use both the edge and node features to update the embeddings. Again, there exist a couple of other papers that go into a similar direction and I display some of them here on this page. SenseNet, for instance, also alternates node and edge embedding layers, but without using the attention mechanism. The co-embedding of nodes and edges is basically the same paper as it comes from the same group of researchers. So now we've seen many different ways how we can use edge features and GNNs. Finally, let's quickly talk about how we can use these approaches in the popular GNN library PyTorch Geometric. All you have to do is navigate to the documentation and scan the different layers for the following attributes. If you find edge weight as argument for one layer, that simply means you can pass other values than 0 or 1 to the adjacency matrix. Edge type means that the implementation can work with different edge types as we've seen it before. Finally, if you find edge etcher, that means the layer can handle multidimensional edge features. For more recent papers with edge embeddings, there's currently not so much available, but I can imagine that the implementations will follow soon. Otherwise, you can always create a pull request with your own implementation of a paper and help the deep learning community with this contribution. Let's quickly have a look at two examples in PyTorch Geometric. 
Okay, so here we are on the documentation page and you can see we have this rtcnconf layer. On GitHub, there's for the repository PyTorch Geometric also an example part where you find different examples. And here you can see there's one example for this rtcn paper. And here we import this layer and we can directly use it in our model definition here. And we can now specify the number of relations, so the number of edge types we have. And down here in the usage, you can see we pass the edge types of our data set to our model. So the second example is for this nnconf layer. Again, if I click on this, uh, you can see the propagation formula here. And down here you find edge etcher. And as I said, that stands for multidimensional edge features. So now if we go to GitHub again and look at the examples folder, we find another example for this nnconf layer and it's simply imported here. And you can see in this function, the edge attributes are calculated in some way. And the layer and then conf is defined as conf1 here and another conf2 here. And in the forward function, we now pass the edge etcher, so our multidimensional edge features to this layer and simply include it as it's described in the paper. So now that's it for this video. We've seen different possibilities to use edge features in graph neural networks. I hope this helped you as a starting point and I'm pretty sure we will see many new approaches in the next years. But wait, there's one more thing. Who are these people? Well, they are created, of course, with a generative adversarial network. And I really thought whether I need to cite them or not. That's actually also an interesting thought in my opinion. Who do you cite if an AI creates things like text or images? Leave a comment what you think and I'll see you soon in the next video.